So once again, good morning and welcome to our Sunday service. Really happy to have all you here with us. And my, for those of you who came in late, my name is Naya Swami Devi. This is Naya Swami Jyotish. We've been disciples of Paramahansa Yogananda for more than 40 years and students of Swami Kriyananda for that same period of time. So we're very happy to have you with us. And I'll make a little announcement also. For those of you who are able to stay at 2 o'clock this afternoon, Jyotish and I will be starting a six-week series on discipleship. And the first class will be right here at 2 o'clock, 2 to 2.30 we hope you all can join us. Pardon? 2 to 3.30. Yeah, it's longer than a half hour. <laughs> Payback. I always correct Brooke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, our topic this week is the infinite Christ. And this is from a book called Rays of the One Light, Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The Gospel of St. John contains some of the most profound spiritual teachings in the Bible. In the first chapter, many subtle truths are suggested concerning higher stages of self-realization. Here, John the Baptist is described as one reaching up toward that high state. He was not that light, the gospel tells us, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Jesus Christ, by contrast, is described as the light itself. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. One essential truth stands out in this teaching, that Jesus came not to dogmatize people with a new teaching, but to bring them timeless universal truths. Disciples saw the master clothed in human form and therefore judged him in terms of his greatness relative to the greatness of other teachers. Wisdom, however, sees the master's very greatness in terms of cosmic unity. There is a passage in The New Path by Swami Kriyananda in which this point is emphasized. The master, Paramhansa Yogananda, explained. The saints, excuse me, the saint, who attains that exalted consciousness never says, I am God, for he sees it was the vast ocean that became his little wave of ego. The wave, in other words, would not claim when referring to the little self to be the ocean. At this juncture, Debbie Mukherjee, a disciple of masters, cried, but sir, if you are one with that ocean, that means you are God. Why I, the master asked, say he, he is God. But still, sir, you are one with him, and he is the only reality. That means you too are God. But this body isn't God. You aren't identified with your body, sir, so one may still say that you are God. Well, in that case, why do you say you? You too are that. In a discussion of this sort, it is less confusing if we say he. But what's the difference? He was a very aggressive disciple. <laughs> the scriptures say, ma excuse me, the scriptures say, Master Broke began, it's only your humility, sir, Debbie broke in, that makes you distinguish between yourself and him. How can there be humility when there is no consciousness of ego? Triumphantly, Davy cried, but if you have no ego left, that means you are God. Master laughingly continued the earlier statement, which Davy had interrupted. The scriptures say, he who knows Brahma becomes Brahma. There, cried Davy, you said it yourself. Master rejoined, still laughingly, I didn't say it. It's the scriptures that say so. 
Master, in other words, would not identify those words with the human body speaking them. It was in his overarching spirit that he saw himself one with the infinite. But Deby was unable to make this mental leap from a pure expression of infinity to infinity itself. You quoted those scriptures, sir, he reminded Master relentlessly. That means you agree with them. Recognizing that the distinction was perhaps too subtle for many to grasp, Master concluded, well, he who says he is God isn't God. And he added with a smile, he who says he isn't, isn't. And there the subject rested amid general laughter. The greater a spiritual teaching, the more greatly we betray it by particularizing it with dogma. Truth itself, not the Christian truth or the Hindu truth, incarnates on earth with the birth of a fully liberated master. As the Bhagavad Gita teaches us in the fourth chapter, unborn, changeless, Lord of creation, and controller of my cosmic nature, though I am. Yet, entering nature, I am dressed in the cosmic garment of my own maya delusion. O Bharata, whenever virtue declines and vice predominates, I incarnate on earth. Taking visible form, I come to destroy evil and reestablish virtue. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. I actually met Debbie Mukherjee, the man in this story when I was in India with Swami Kriyananda in 1974. And he was quite a character. He never seemed to, I only met him for one evening, but during that evening he never talked at anything less than a half shout. <laughs> and he was very argumentative, very. Uh, at this point he was trying to convince Swamiji not only to pay for some past medical expenses, but to take on his entire medical care for all f future. And so he was bringing out all these arguments. And it, because it was before Swamiji had taken on the uh, monastic name of Swami Kriyananda, Debbie knew him as uh, Don Walters, which is what he was when he entered the uh, SRF. And they were brother disciples there together. But Debbie would kept saying, have you thought of that, Don? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of that, Don? Have you thought of that? <laughs> and he kept shouting that over and over again. So you can see him arguing with Master just relentlessly and not, not allowing Master to have the last word until Master finally gave up and uh, uh, admitted that Debbie wasn't quite grasping the subtleties. Subtlety and Debbie, at least in my uh, little uh, interchange, were not two things I would naturally pair together. <laughs> I want to start with this beautiful prayer poem from, or prayer demand from uh, Whispers from Eternity by Master. This is prayer demand, make me anything, a Christian or a Hindu, anything to realize the let me be a Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, Mohammedan, or Sufi. I care not what my religion, race, creed, or color, if only I can win my way to thee. But let me be none of these, if that identity enmeshes me in an enclosing net of religious or social formalities. Let me travel the royal high road of realization which leads to thee. If I am traveling on some bypath of religion, lead me into the one common highway of realization, which leads straight to thee. 
Send me the sunshine of thy wisdom, that it lead me to the morning of my growing powers, and send me the moon of thy mercy to guide me rightly, if ever I am lost in the dark night of sorrow. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> this, obviously, this little exchange with Debbie is uh, humorous, and we can, because of the humor, we can uh, miss the depth of what that exchange was really all about. And it's not just a personal exchange between master and a disciple, or even for us, the exchange that we read in the new path and kind of teaches us. It really captures one of the absolutely major trends of our age, which is our age, we're in a transitional age, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but a transitional age between two great eras or yugas, as they're called in India. And we're a little ways into Dwapara Yuga, which is the age of energy, but we've come out of uh, Kali Yuga, which is the age of form. And so if we pull back and don't see it just for the amusing little exchange it was, what Debbie was trying to say is, I want to capture God in form. You are God. Your form is God. That's it. You're God. The form is God. And Master was saying, why say this form is God? He is God. He has produced this form. And Debbie couldn't get that. But you are God. You're saying that you're God. The scriptures say, you know. And so he couldn't, he couldn't grasp that subtlety. <clears throat> but believe me, he is not alone in not being able to grasp. Thank you. In not being able to grasp the uh, subtle distinction between form and essence. And it's one of the... Uh, one of the reasons that Yogananda came to the West was to help in that transition. But here again, we, don't, we as disciples of Yogananda don't want to get caught in the same trap that he was trying to pull Debbie out of, which is to think that only Yogananda was doing this. There's a whole change of ages, and yes, it, our line of gurus is very, very important in that, but they aren't causative of it. They're messengers from God. It's God's change of ages. And it isn't just through them. It's going on all over the world. One of the trends that we see in our current reality is that there are still a few holdovers of the consciousness from Kali Yuga. It's diminishing, but there are holdovers. And they feel their... Uh, worldview slipping away from them, the Kali Yuga worldview. So there are fundamentalists in all religions who want to hold on to the old forms that uh, provide them with a certain amount of security. And so uh, they will hold on very, very tightly because Somewhere in their heart of hearts, in their subconscious mind, they know that that worldview is slipping away. The world is no longer interested, by and large, because we're moving into this new age of energy. And energy is, um, is much more subtle and much more able to see the unity of everything. It's very like the one way of thinking about the change from form to energy is Kali Yuga is like a whole bunch of ice cubes. And that those ice cubes, you can take them and you can move them around on the plate and you can separate them and they stay separated and you clash them together and they crack and bang and all of that. But Dwapara Yuga, because the vibration is rising, the energy is rising, it's like that old form, those ice cubes are melting. And now what you have is a bowl of water, and there are still a few remnants of the ice cubes floating around in there trying to get everything to freeze back up. 
in, into form so that, so that they can hold on to their security because they identify their uh, religion or their way or their security by having it very carefully defined, exactly this, can't be that. It's all religions. In, in the uh, Christian Bible, uh, uh, Christian fundamentalism, they believe that everything that was there in the Bible is exactly literally true. Yogananda was one time talking with a fundamentalist, and, and this man was talking about everything in the Bible is literally, literally true. And so Master said, well, in that case, in the story of Adam and Eve, there's a snake that talks to them. Do you think that snake actually? Yes, in those days, snakes could talk. <laughs> and they went through a few more exchanges like that. And then Master, actually with uh, humor, but also humil humility, said, I, I took off his hat and said, I bow to the temple of ignorance I perceive before me. <laughs> and so... That's an amusing story, but is it Christians alone? No. We have a friend who studied in a, uh, who was Jewish, studied in a rabbinical school. And the temple, there's a, a part of the belief is that the temple of Jerusalem will, um, that was torn down in Roman times, will descend again and, and onto earth. And this rabbi said, if I, with my own eyes, see it descend and is there in solid form, I won't believe it's true until I measure its perimeter and it, uh, it's the same as it says in the Bible. The temple of ignorance, I bow. I bow to the temple of ignorance of the Taliban who are willing to kill people to uh, make sure that their worldview is um, upheld somehow. It's all over. So I mean, these little ice cubes are floating in every part of the little bowl of the world that we find ourselves in and clashing and cranking and breaking up and causing a, a good deal of difficulty for us. But nonetheless, we have moved from that age into an age that is much more open and uh, liberal. Master talked quite a bit about the difference between churchianity and Christianity. See, we have to be careful that we ourselves don't throw out the, well here, the, the bowl of water with the ice cubes instead of the baby with the bath water. We don't throw it all out because we don't like those little forms that are there. Well, that old form of churchianity is there in every religion, but Master, because part of what he was meant to do was to come to the West, talked about Christianity as opposed to churchianity. And there's a great difference because Christianity, the true understanding and the teachings of Christ, Jesus, the Christ, are deep, mystical, true teachings. And if we lock them into form and then don't understand the form and throw out that form, then we're in, in difficulty in that way too. So Master came to show that underneath the surface differences of the various religions, that as you go down deeper, all of them are basically the same religion. Sanat and Dharma, that we came out from God and that the whole drama of life is a kind of an evolution of our consciousness until we realize once again that we are nothing but God. Just as Master was talking about, the wave in his form realized that he was one with the ocean. Now when he wasn't in a position of having to deal with unsubtle kind of fundamental minds, then he expressed it differently. Swami just a couple of days ago told us that um, one time he had a discussion with Master and something had happened and uh, Master asked him about it. 
And Swami said, who, Master told Swami, I know every thought that you think. And he demonstrated it many times. And uh, not just with Swami, but with others. And so this incident had happened, and Master asked uh, Swami about it. And uh, Swami told him, but then he said, rather puzzled, he said, didn't you know about it, Master? And Master, it, Swami said, Master said, very abruptly, when you're one with God, you are God. Completely reversal of the answer that he was giving to Debbie Mukherjee. Because Swami had the uh, subtlety of understanding that Master wasn't really talking about his form or his body. The consciousness was identified with God and was God. When you're one with God, you are God. But in that consciousness, he would not say, I am God. He would rather say, God is this form, Yogananda. In, in the example used in the path, he wouldn't say the wave is the ocean. He would say the ocean has become the wave. But when the wave has completely identified with the ocean, there's no difference in consciousness. So it's a subtle but important point. Now, what Master talked about in churchianity and Christianity is that the churches in the past froze the consciousness into form and then had a separation between man and God. In fact, in the Christian, most Christian theologists will say that God is wholly different from his creation. And so that we can never become God because God is wholly other than, the, than his creation. The best we can aspire to is to be somehow live a good life in accordance with the laws and the dictums that have been given us. And if we do, we get to go to heaven and sit on the right hand of God or at least be near God in heaven in an eternal life. But we're still wholly other. And then there's kind of this, uh, that doesn't work because quite. So there's the son of God, who's the only one who's born on earth, who actually is, is like God and can become God. And so Christ then becomes unique and uniquely different from us. And the Bible says uh, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and none cometh unto the Father but by me. And so those who are locked in to, we are wholly different from God, and only Christ can be the Son of God, they will quote that, saying, only Christ is the Son of God. Uh, it's too long of a story but we to tell in its full glory, but we once went to a... Uh, meeting called by this religious group and they, they had invited and insisted they had called us a dozen times at least and kind of insisting that we come to this meeting and so we got there and there was a catholic priest and a nun and a, we were the yogis and uh, there was a, some buddhist monk there and so on and they were basically there to tell us that only their way was the right way and, and this person was saying, you know, they had a map of the universe. And they showed how high Jesus had gotten and how high Buddha had gotten and how high Krishna had gotten. And then the culmination of it was that God has never, ever manifested on this earth. You might as well accept that, you religionists. He's never manifested on this earth, except in one case. He manifested as our master. <laughs> and isn't that the way of, of all these separate ice cubes? To say not only is my way separate, but my way is the only way. My way is the best way. The real explanation of I am the truth and the light, and no man cometh unto the Father by me, is a deeply mystical expression. It means that the Christ consciousness is God's consciousness that's present 
in every atom of creation, in every subatomic particle, in every galaxy, in the farthest star, in the closest, innermost thought in your own heart. God is everywhere. But that essence of God that has manifested in creation, what that statement means, no one comes unto the Father except by me, first you have to realize God in creation before you can advance sufficiently to merge with him beyond creation. And so that's the meaning of that. It isn't I, Jesus, in the only way. It's very mystical. So Master came to show that deep Christianity and deep uh, yogic teachings or, or Krishna's Gita, so the Bible and the Gita, are explaining the same truths. That's why every morning on Sunday morning, we read from uh, this book that shows parallel passages showing the unity between the thought of those two. But it isn't just that Yogananda has brought this. It's a whole change of ages, and there's a profound change taking place in the West, in America. A Gallup poll relatively recently asked people whether they felt that uh, their spirituality was dependent on organized religion or whether it was a personal and private thing. 75% said it was personal and private. 70% of Americans feel that you can come unto God, you can find God or eternal life, however they define it, by any of a number of different religions. And so this whole kind of frozen thought form is breaking down. There's a whole movement into America of the understanding of this. You know that the first English translation of the Bhagavad Gita came out less than 10 years after the forming of this country? 1785. Our country was formed 1776. And so less than 10 years. America really is a Dwapara Yuga country. All of the European countries basically were formed many, many centuries earlier. But America was formed at the time of the change of ages into Dwapara Yuga. But, and Master said that America and India will unite to lead the world. Why is that? Because America as a country, as a civilization, as a kind of uh, culture, is forward-looking. And, and we don't have the old ways to have to cling to. But India provides the consciousness, the Vedas provide the consciousness that's needed during this next period of Dwapara Yuga. And so the consciousness of India and the cultural forms of America are mixing. And they're mixing in both directions. You go to India, we go to India, we have an ashram there, and right around the ashram are 20 or 30 malls that look exactly like you walk into that mall and except for the, uh, I guess, the odors of the little vendors there, you think you're in America. You know, jeans, Da Vinci, um, Gavinci. Gavinci, she knows. <laughs> I'm a non-shopper. So, yeah, so I go into the malls and kind of look around and pretty colors. Oh, Nike, Reebok, yes, I do buy running shoes. There's, she got me. So, yeah, so there are some athletic stores there. But they're all Western stores. And you, uh, Master said that many Indian souls, look around, are being born in the West, and many Western souls are being born in the East, in India particularly, to bring about this merging of the two, India, thought form, America, uh, ability to handle the physical world correctly. Those two now need to come together. In fact, there was, it's, it's all part of God's plan. There was a pope 
around the fifth century who had a vision and he, he wanted to bring the church more toward a mystical direction. He had a vision and told him, no, do not do that. It is not yet the time. Later on, there needs to be a separation between Eastern thought and Western thought. And later on will be the right time for these two streams to come together. But it's not now, not in Kali Yuga. Of course, I don't think the vision used those words, but that was the essence of it. So these two needed to be separated because mankind didn't have enough horsepower to both handle the needed, um, I don't know, the, the energy and concentration and determination needed to be able to uh, produce the physical goods and the uh, quality of life and science and health and all of that that has been the specialty of the Western world. On the other hand, the Indian, particularly that culture, specialized in consciousness, in God communion. And you go today in India and you see terrible poverty still infrastructure that we wouldn't put up with for two minutes, um, health problems and disease. So America is bringing that needed specialty while Vedantic thought is coming to America to bring what we need, which is a loosening up of consciousness. So Master called at sometimes his work the second coming of Christ, but it isn't to be interpreted as the second coming of Jesus, necessarily, even though Jesus is here on our altar, for the reason that Jesus asked Babaji. In fact, when did he ask Babaji? Just about the same time that first Gita was being translated into English. See, it's all, it all weaves together and works together. He came to Babaji and asked that a representative of that Vedantic thought come to the West to, to uh, bring that uh, revolution of, of consciousness to us. And that culminated in Master being sent to Sri Yukteswar and coming. So Christ and Babaji together, as we're going to hear in our Festival of Light, which is, by the way, because some of you haven't been exposed to it, the Festival of Light that we're going to end the service with is a kind of poetic rendition of the essence of this path. Because years ago, Swami realized that if we give a talk on Sunday morning about one particular aspect, then we don't cover these other aspects. And so he did a poetic rendition of kind of the totality of the path. And you'll hear... The, uh, if you listen sensitively to these same deep thoughts, then you hear the story of a bird. That's the evolution of the soul or the evolution of consciousness of the soul from kind of rebellion up to enlightenment. And so, so we end with that. But Master came to bring the second coming of Christ, but not as Jesus in form, the second coming of understanding that Christ is this universal consciousness. So that that's why this morning's reading that Christ was that light because he had identified and completely merged with that light. Well, John, who was the uh, person, was still reaching toward that light. He was the herald of that light. But it isn't its consciousness it isn't people and form and personalities. It's this great mixing of consciousness. And so this line has come, not uniquely, but definitely with the purpose of bringing this deep teaching that we are expressions of God. We are, in our essence, nothing except God. And our job as people who live on the planet and live in God's world is to grow in consciousness until we realize our unity with him, until we become self-realized. 
And that's the message Swam, uh, Master came with. He came not only with the philosophy of it, he came also with the techniques that will get us there. God bless. with